Mr. Walton, did you make contact with Alien? Were you taken to another planet, to a mothership? How did they communicate with them? Can you tell me what they look like? Can you tell me how many of them there were? Were you, were you given food? But the teachers are alive. They're not books. They are the very living essences of nature itself. What a strange person. Unbelievably powerful supercomputer that's running our reality, and we don't have a clue yep. as to how to operate it. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system, and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? What's outside the simulation? Say in your mind, say to yourself, I am more than my physical body because I am more than physical matter. I can perceive that which is greater than the physical world. from New York, upstate near the Great Lakes. This is Lighting the Void, and I'm your host, Joe Root. Man, it's good to be back. I just come sliding into the studio a couple hours ago, actually. Left here, went to Arkansas, came back, all in the white Honda. Tonight, we're here, as promised, with Michael Cremo as our guest tonight. It will be a perfect discussion to discuss what we discussed last night in a deeper sense. Hoping maybe Jared might show up again tonight. I don't know. I think he's busy, but it'd be cool if he shows up. So Michael Cremo's here is with us tonight. Make sure you download the new Fringe FM app, Google Play, Alexa, iTunes, all the good stuff. It has a shout out feature on there, so you guys can actually, if you don't want to call in or you don't want to, um, or you just want to say a quick shout out to the station, it has a shout out option. There's a news feed there. It also has an alarm clock. It's got all the links. Uh, to our social media pages and some contact info. It's a much better app than the one we had before. It's also even got its own chat room, too, so you can play around with that. But our main chat room is our Discord server. So if you go to thefringe.fm forward slash chat room, you'll find all the cool people hanging out over there. And if when we if and when we open the phone lines up, we have four lines. That number is 1-800-588-0335. Toll free from the United States or Canada. The biggest announcement we have is the Fringe Fest that is coming up Halloween weekend. We got more speakers confirmed. Alana Freeland is also going to be a speaker. So we've got, uh, you know, Jordan Maxwell, Clyde Lewis, now Alana Freeland, uh, Guy Winters, Karen Dahlman, Linda Godfrey. I hate to say all the speakers because you know I'm going to miss one or leave one out uh, more than likely. Uh, Mary Ducine is going to do a presentation. We're also going to have live performances and by, and some performances from our host. And we have more that we're adding to the event. The tickets are only $15. Go to the Fringe best.com that's all weekend long it's an online event so you're not going to miss out on anything cool plus you get a recording of it as well it's worth it totally worth it if you go to the fringe.fm you can sign up there as well too other than that i want to thank you guys for your patience for me um i was out and ryan gable filled in for me and he did a fantastic job after 600 and something episodes i've never done that before 
And I got to say, I trust Ryan to do that. And he did a very good job. I gave him a crash course in training. I got in the car, went down to see my son, and uh, everything worked out all right. So good stuff there. Also, uh, we'll, we're going to be giving away two free tickets every night. When we open the phone lines up, your chance to win those tickets too as well, all the way up until the event. Pretty fun stuff. Okay, so Michael Cremo here is here with us, and this is a pretty special show for me. I'm sure it is for you too. First time he's been on Lighting the Void. If you've never heard of him, Michael Cremo is on the cutting edge of science and, and culture issues, and the course of a few months' time, he might have found he he might be found on a pilgrimage to sacred sites in India, appearing on a national television show, lecturing at a mainstream science conference, or speaking to an alternative uh, science gathering. As he crosses disciplinary and culturally uh, culturally boundaries, he presents to his various audiences a compelling case for negotiating a new consensus on the nature of reality. The website for reference tonight is M Cremo. That's M C R E M O. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the broadcast. It's good to have you with us. Good to be with you and all your listeners. This is a very interesting subject to me because I, you know, we we typically talk about. Uh, things esoteric and conscious and conscious exploration. Um, But this all intertwines to me because I remember I've brought this up on the broadcast a few times, studying uh, world religion in college. I always thought for some reason that Judaism was the oldest religion because I was brought up a Christian only to find out that according to, I guess, mainstream education, that uh, the Hindu religion is the oldest religion. And if you look up what the Vedas say, how old we actually are, don't they say that we have been around for like 150-something trillion years? Isn't that what they say? Um, Yes. Uh, That's because the universe has a purpose. Uh, We're not accidental creatures living in an accidental universe. Um, the universe has a purpose and it has to do with consciousness. It has to do with the consciousness of the inhabitants of the universe. And, you know, I talk about this in a book that I wrote, Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. I mean, most scientists today believe we're just machines made of molecules, a random uh, output of evolution by natural selection. We're completely material beings. We're just machines made of matter. And it's an accidental universe that just happened to But that ignores the main feature of our life, consciousness, something Mm. we all have. And in this world, our consciousness feels a little bit limited. Uh, There's so much destruction going on and uh, so, so much uh, degradation of the environment and all of that, we kind of feel a little bit limited here. That's because as conscious, individual, personal selves, we are from some higher level of reality. You could call it, I call it sometimes the level of pure consciousness. Yeah. And this universe that we're in now is like a place where conscious selves who aren't really fit at the present moment to exist on that level of pure consciousness because they have uh, a little bit of selfishness. Yeah, mm-hmm. what's in it for me? So the, the ruling principle of that higher level of existence is loving, harmonious cooperation between all conscious entities and the source of all conscious entities, which is also individual, personal, and conscious. So for those conscious selves who aren't ready for that, there's an alternative place, and that's this material universe. And when the conscious self comes at any time, you, you can interrupt me because no, I, I'll just go on. And yeah, on. well, I'm just listening you because know, this so. is, I, I, I'm, I'm a more of a, I guess, a hermetic Kabbalist myself. But to me, it all comes from the same place. Uh, 
and it all goes i think i think just about everything goes back uh to the vedas you know um if you really look at it and it's like Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know how so your book this is what i'm saying this i said this last night i said you know we got so many people that that give information we hear stuff from nasa and we hear stuff from seti and we hear stuff from starlink and uh not starlink but spacex and everybody's trying to figure out who to believe on what's out there or where we came from and stuff and we stop looking at the evidence and then any evidence that's given that goes against uh what we've been told always just either gets passed off or it isn't taken seriously to the point but you've you've really like done your work in that field i would say and uh and have really put it out there i'm wondering here because i'm reading them about human de-evolution this is what i'm trying to find you're saying in this book or this quote here on human uh de-evolution.com says that this book uh, contains solid scientific evidence showing how a subtle mind element and a conscious self that can exist apart from the body have been systematically eliminated from mainstream science by a process of knowledge filtration and any time that knowledge filtration takes place, you can expect a great deal of resistance, criticism, and ridicule when it is exposed. What, this is an obvious thing, I think, now, then you've really exposed this to, this knowledge filtration, but do you believe that there's a, a force out there that's <clears throat> actually trying to prevent us from understanding this? Um. I think there are forces here and out there, as you say, that are trying to do that. But ultimately, I'm, I'm not uh, one of these people that are uh, into what I call cosmic paranoia. Sure. That uh, my, my firm conviction, not just conviction, I, I, I don't want, even want to say belief. It's my conviction, my experience, my... Uh, uh, my conclusion that there's an ultimate force of good okay. in the universe and that in the end it's, it, it's up to each individual to make the choice which direction they're going to go in towards the darkness or towards the light and I, I think there are forces like that today to say, no, don't, don't think about mind and consciousness. You're just a machine made of molecules. And, and, and that's very uh, good for people that want to uh, uh, exploit and dominate and control others. Because if you think I'm just a purely material being, that your goals and values become very materialistic, you'll think to uh, work and consume is the main purpose of human life. And that generates a lot of material wealth, which flows into the pockets of the people who know how to exploit that system. Yeah. And they want to keep people like that because if they start asking these questions, then they might not, uh, be such good consumers and producers, right. you know, messes up the whole system. So I think that's the reason the knowledge filtration goes on to exclude the idea of extraterrestrials, to exclude the idea of a conscious self that's different than the brain, different than the body, to exclude all kinds of things, the evidence of paranormal phenomena, things like that, uh, UFOs. Uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, it tends to create some, you know, that kind of information that comes out tends to disturb the whole basis upon which our modern worldwide human civilization is now based. Yeah. So. Right, and you got a point too that you know the whole uh, cosmic paranoia narrative doesn't really help much either. You know things. It, it's been discussed on the show before, obviously, because we've discussed many things. But things like demons, archons, or the cabal, or all some 
some deep spirit out there to keep you disempowered. But really, if you look at it, like you're saying, it's a lot of ego and control. And no, you can follow the money and follow the power and see what's going on. It's, it's something we talk about quite a bit on the show. But I believe, and I'm curious about what your opinion is on this, because it, here you are, guy, that I'm, I remember listening to you on Jeffrey Mishlove, who I'm a big fan of his. And you were like, you know, I don't. Yes. You're like, I don't have to uh, really tell people what I believe, even though I, I will. But I I'm, just want to be able to submit this evidence and let people make up their minds. And there's uh, mainstream scientists out there that will say, well, these things are just few and far between. But you've shown that, you know, without a doubt, that there's all kinds of evidence out there that our history is not what we've been told. And if that's the case, then religion and the Vedas and whatever came before it must go back even further. And it just, I don't know when we're going to start, like when science is going to take the approach that maybe they don't, maybe, maybe they have the least of things figured out. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I love science. Don't get me wrong, but it, it's like they assume that, going into anything other than physical reality or matter is a waste of time. Most science believes that. I don't know why. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think that's the result of some things that have happened over the past, uh, six or 700 years in the Western world, basically Europe, America, um, which is where what we call science today became really dominant. If you go back, you know, 500 years or so in Europe, they had scientists, they had scientific associations and things like that. But if you look at the kinds of things they were, that they were including in their picture of the universe, they had the idea of, different levels of reality, a terrestrial level, a more subtle, uh, mystical level, and then a purely spiritual level. And they, and all the different levels were populated with different types of beings on earth. You know, you have, you have plants, animals, human beings, uh, Beyond that, there's the realm of angels, jinn, devas, demigods, and beyond that, you know, some source, original source of everything. So, and they had, and that was the scientific worldview five or six hundred years ago. And they were into all kinds of things, alchemy, uh, you know, they were investigating witchcraft. And, mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, scientists were that was the world of science well paracelsus but healed around, people with alchemy i mean there were several cases where he healed people uh diseases that we that haven't really healed yet and they just kind of threw it out because it was nonsense to them now but they if you know we got a guy that's actually looking into that or, or spagyric you know plant medicine alchemy that he was doing uh, uh phoenix aurelius and he's trying to get it uh peer-reviewed based on the data that he collects from it so yeah, it is kind of sad. A lot of that stuff got tossed out, isn't it? Yeah, and the, there was a, the reason for it. You know, if you investigate, yeah, you know, the history of it, like the founding of the Royal Institute in London and other early scientific societies, influential scientists, some of them, they decided uh, we we got to focus more. You know, let's let's focus on ordinary matter and really try to understand that. And let's let's set aside these mystical powers and uh, life airs and vital vital forces and all all that. And let's just concentrate on ordinary matter and and learn how it works and learn how to describe it, predict what it will do, you know, according to some mathematical laws. Mm. And they decide to do that. And it was very profitable because with their understanding of ordinary matter and their focus on that to the exclusion of everything else, 
they were able to come up with technologies. They were able to provide governments with new weapons. Uh, and that's still one of the driving forces of science today, the ability to supply governments with weapons. And I, man, sophisticated weapons. You guys, you guys heard it right there. Michael Cremo said it. I've been saying this for almost a year now that we're being run by mad scientists who are creating dangerous things, powerful things. They've, they've created lasers, space weapons, what they're calling like anti-asteroid weapons, energy stuff. It's all documented too. And I always wonder like, okay, if these people are the most intelligent that we have to offer on this planet, then who's really overseeing them? I, you know, you take CERN, for example, right? Now they've got the, that thing powered up more than it's ever been powered up, and they're trying to create uh, what they say is harmless, microscopic black holes. They're trying to create black holes. How do they really know that's harmless with all of the data that we have on black holes? Why are we letting them, like, who gets to oversee these people? You know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> that was one reason why science is the way it is today. Yeah. And then the second reason is, like, they were able to produce consumer products, mm. things that corporations could sell to people. Yeah, whether it's something like watches or whatever, but they were able to come up with uh, microscopes, telescopes, uh, all kinds of instruments and technologies. Uh -huh. and corporations loved it because they could sell these things to people and then they they were able to come up with some effective pharmaceuticals that had some effect and companies like that and then the government liked all the economic activity that was based on these technologies and the public also was complicit you could right. say and I think we still are because we like this stuff. Right. You know. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we we blame them all the time, right? But it's like, well, uh, we're just telling them what to give us, and then when they give it to us, we don't do anything about it but take more of it. So why, can, why are we pointing our finger at them all the time, you know? I get your point. So we're, we can't yeah. let ourselves off the hook either. Right. So, and... They got all that by excluding from science any idea of some higher power having some influence, God or higher beings, to have any influence on what's going on on the level of ordinary matter. And they also excluded non-material substances like subtle material energies, a soul, conscious self, whatever. That's all out of the world of science. And it doesn't have to be like that because at different points in history, you know, science has included those things. But, and I think in the current age, it really became very intense around the time of World War One. You know, hmm. because the governments were saying, we need weapons, we need this, we need that. You've got to get yourselves together. You know, the universities and scientists, you know, you've got to get yourself together, produce more scientists, not individuals that just go off and think about stuff and research whatever they want to research. But we need groups of scientists to work on weapons programs, developing technologies, for market, and that's why you go to a university today, it's a consortium of the university, the, uh, <clears throat> the government, which includes the military, different things, and the corporations, the big corporations. That's uh, <clears throat> more or less how it, how it works, and and like I said, we also kind of buy into that whole system and therefore it keeps going on. Yeah. Uh, right. 
Well, you know, uh, that that is so true. I mean, we discussed that last night, too. Another thing, too, though, is, like, how do we um, how do we keep, pass up all this? It just doesn't make sense to me because, I mean, I haven't studied your work as well as others. you got some big fans out there, man, that know just every word of your books and they know everything you've done. And when I look at this data that you present about our history, this goes right along, by the way, with things like, you know, Robert Schock showing weathering on the Sphinx and uh, other things that have been shown to us, how it's not a laughable thing that we just pass it up. And it should be, I just don't get how it's not, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't get how it's not on the top of the scientist's agenda. Like, to me, not understanding or fi- or seeing evidence like all of these things that you present would be would make me want to move the research to the top to try to understand who we are, where we come from, all that stuff. But it's it's like, yeah, I guess you got a point because the whole agenda isn't really to to find out the truth. I guess it's to keep pushing a narrative, maybe because it has something to do with control as well. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't say. It's a hundred percent like that in the world of sure. science today. You can find different individuals, groups of scientists, but they're not in the majority. And what happens today is that those that are in the majority, they have marginalized and silenced their, uh, you could say their the the people who are within the scientific community who are kind of pushing the boundaries in different ways. So, so through, and it's in most places, it's, it's through their, their government enforced monopoly in the education system, the public education system, where they're able to, uh, exclude, anything that may exist in the scientific world, but which, what goes against what the current majority consensus view is. How hard do you think it was for someone like, I know you're familiar with Robert Schock and I know you, you keep up with a lot of this stuff. How hard do you think it was for him? when he realized what he saw to come out and say, you know, I gotta, I have to put my entire reputation on the line and speak the truth here. You know, I mean, you know, we, we get uh, upset about that. They don't, um, I guess the science doesn't go against the narrative sometimes, so they want to keep all that. But I, I, there is some pressure there, I'm sure. Cause I mean, like it, it, your whole career depends on your word, I think sometimes, or, or what you go along with. So, do you think it was just it's it was really hard for him to admit that? I I think so. And then you also have example. I mean, Robert Schock is an excellent example. Doctor John Mack of Harvard University. He was head oh, yeah. of the uh, uh, psychiatry department of the Harvard University Medical School. He got interested in alien abductions. Yeah, that's one of these kind of forbidden topics. I mean, I use that word. You know, I call my 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 book on uh, archaeological forbidden evidence archaeology. forbidden archaeology. Yeah, so he 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 became interested in in these things, and he decided to do a, an investigation, a medical investigation of people who had reported these. Uh, alien abductions being taken from their house at night up into a some spaceship operated by extraterrestrials. And you know, he 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 was very interested in what he found. He found I mean the normal explanation is these are people they're psychotic, they're neurotic, they're imagining things, hallucinating. Yeah. But you know he carefully interviewed them and determined according to his professional judgment that 
Uh, no, the, these people are, they're not psychotic. They're not neurotic. If anything, they're displaying symptoms of post-traumatic stress. You know, people that have had some really shaking kind of experience yeah. in battle and a war or an accident or terrorist of an episode or something. And he started publishing, publishing writings about these things, books, articles. And th- at Harvard University, they decided we can't have this. You know, some professors anyways, maybe not the university itself, but they, they tried to have him, his tenure removed. Tenure means you get a lifetime appointment, sort of like a, a Supreme Court judge or something or a federal judge, lifetime of appointment which is to give you the freedom to make judgments or in the case of a university professor, the freedom to investigate whatever you think needs investigating and speak about it without being pressured by, but they thought he'd just gone a little bit too far. So they convened an academic court had to try him. Now he got through it amazingly. And this was some years ago and I met him, you know, I was at a conference. It was actually a crop circle conference in Glastonbury, England. And he was there. He came to my lecture. I came to his, we kind of agreed to stay in touch with each other. And shortly after that, he died in a kind of mysterious automobile accident in England. But yeah, Robert Schock, uh, I think he got a lot of pushback when he published in the scientific publications his yeah. work on the Sphinx enclosure and how it did yeah, that. Yeah. But I think he's kind of gone beyond that. He still maintains, as far as I know, his position as a yeah. professor. He definitely at has. University. And- it definitely has, and it, you know, it's kind of a more of a rhetorical question for the audience too, because if you guys remember, and I look at Michael the same way I look at Robert too. You remember when Robert came on the broadcast? We got to go into our break here. He came on to lighting the void, and I asked him directly that question, and he told he told a story about just exactly how hard it was and the kinds of things that happen and the reason why. So when Michael uh, thank you for expressing that because it's it's very true that this stuff is controlled and that you can't, well, it's not easy just to come out and say, hey, I found some evidence uh, that doesn't go along with what you're saying and I want to know why. Why is that such a bad thing? Well, you know what we're going to do when we come back from the break? We're going to talk about some of the evidence more about Michael's work and some of his findings as well. And you know me, I like to get into what people believe deep down in their soul and a little bit of conscious exploration. More Lighting the Void coming up. Stay with us. This is KTLK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. This is Jason Lindgren from Crow 777 Radio, and you can hear us 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday night here on The Fringe FM. 
Have you ever wanted to dream about being a character in your favorite video game or movie? Would you like to dream your fantasy with all five senses in detail and remember everything? It's time to bring the dream in mind back online. Introducing Dreaming for Gamers from Ian Wilson. Dreaming for Gamers will teach you how to program your dreams to dream what you want from any video game, movie, or source material that you choose. The courses help rehabilitate the dreaming mind out of atrophy so you can remember your dreams, taste, touch, smell, see, and hear, as well as be self-aware and take complete control Control over the dream state like Neo in the Matrix. You can't catch COVID in a dream, but you can wake up with a happy ending. Type in the fringe.fm forward slash dreamplay and sign up today to get dreaming now. That's the fringe.fm forward slash dreamplay or click the banner at the fringe.fm today and take the seven day dream challenge for free while it lasts. Want more of the fringe? Check out thefringe.fm for more information on your favorite shows. Also, don't forget to check out the Fringe mobile app or the other ways you can tune in through the Paranormal Radio app and talk stream live. Where the normal and paranormal collide, it's the Fringe FM. What do you think would happen if you bring the Fringe FM together with leading voices in the paranormal and unexplained? What if no topic were off limits from cryptids to conspiracies to astrology, psychic abilities, and even ufology? And what would happen if you broadcast this event in crystal clear video, streaming live around the world and allowing viewers like you to interact with their favorite presenters? Then you would have created the monster that is the Fringe Fest 2020. Two nights only, Friday, October 30th, and Saturday, October 31st. For more information and to get your tickets, visit thefringefest.com. That's thefringefest.com. Trick or truth, the only thing scarier is not being there. That's Friday, October 30th, and Saturday, October 31st. Get your tickets now before they sell out at thefringefest.com. You tune into this show at your own risk, because it leads to a state of mind, not a perception that will be, but one that is. I'm Ryan Gable, and this is The Secret Teachings. The analysis offered on this show is objective, removed from the emotional hysteria of the hive mind collective mob of coercive persuasion, the polar divisions in politics and religion, and those that exist in the paranormal, occult, and even in health. By simple observation and common sense, one may decipher the news speak doublespeak, and propaganda of ideological collectives intent on persuading the individual to abandon liberty through coercion and fear. On this show, we will speak to your heart and soul, opening a channel to spirit. And when you tune into this frequency, you are hearing The Secret Teachings, five nights a week on The Fringe FM, with a full archive at thesecretteachings.info. Keep doing the same thing here every night. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Roop. Tonight, our guest is Michael Cremo. Every single night, we're trying to answer the big questions here. The strange and the weird, too, but the big, deep questions of who are we? What's this about? What happens after we die? Where did we come from? That's the big one tonight. I think that's a, that's a real big one. Consciousness, what is consciousness? What's this about spirit? And where did we come from? And I think that our alternate our alternative, excuse me, I've been on the road for two days, but history shows us that there's stuff like um I don't know. I don't know that, that there's more to it. Like uh for instance, the giant thing, Michael. And by the way, before we get into the discussion, I got to give the phone line out. Sorry, it's 1-800-588-0335. First caller to call in tonight will win two 
tickets to the Fringe Fest. My mouth is all chopped up here, but yeah, thefringefest.com. Go to the website, call in, get two free tickets. All right. Um, so, well, some people are already calling in. Let me ask this question and we'll take the phone call. So one of the first things I heard about alternate history was giants, right? Like the Nephilim, that was the biggest thing. Zachariah Stitch and Nephilim. And you would see like these magazine clippings of giant bones and stuff. And I never could tell what was real and what was fake because there was always some other scientists coming out saying, well, this is fake and it's not real. And it turned into these big chat room discussions. When it comes to things like giants, Nephilim, and what they called red hair giants, things like that, what have you have you found anything on that? If you have, what have you found? Uh, I'm personally prepared to accept the existence of giants. By that I mean large size human beings, and uh, I would say a person ten feet tall or higher. That's what I would consider to be a a giant in, in, the, in the sense of being beyond the range of, you know, human uh, height. Because you, a lot of people are seven feet tall today. Some of them play on the NBA teams. And there's a couple of people eight feet tall around the world. And I think there's even one who's about nine feet tall, a man from Mongolia, yeah, you know, I saw a picture of them once. So uh, now in terms of scientific evidence, there have been a lot of reports of such things being found. But if you try to track down the evidence for them, they, uh, you know, to actually get your hands on you know, some of the huge human bones or something like that, it's, uh, I haven't been able to do that up to the present moment. Uh, so there are some things that have been verified, like somebody, I think you just mentioned, Joe, uh, the red haired yeah. giants. But I think those are in the range of seven feet, which is within the modern human range of heights, as far as I, I know. Sure. But these bigger ones, you know, now there was one case which I think really deserves further investigation. Maybe if somebody in France is listening in tonight, they could look into this. It's the Castle Now discoveries that were made uh, around the end of the 19th century, like in 1890 or 1900, around that period of time in France at a place called Castelnau, C-A-S-T-E-L-N-A-U. And there, there was a, a French archaeologist or anthropologist, a Dr. Lapouge, and he found and reported in scientific journals human bones that were very, very large. He didn't find complete skeletons. He found like a thigh bone, uh, a humerus, which is the upper arm bone between the shoulder and the elbow. And uh, these were published with pictures. Yeah, I'm looking at it here. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, he did calculations. You know, if you have a, a thigh bone and you know it's this long, then you can estimate how tall the person who had a thigh bone that size would have been. Mm. And that he, he kind of concluded they, they'd be at least 11 feet tall. Wow. Now, that's a giant. And yeah. somewhere <laughs> in France, I suspect those bones are in some little little hidden corner of some museum there. That's one of the best documented cases that I've seen. I mean, once I went to New Zealand, there was a, a guy there, a businessman, who liked my work. He said, could you, could you come and give some lectures here? I said, oh, sure. So I went, and this man met me uh, 
at the airport in Auckland. And he said to me, you know, I, tomorrow I'd like to show you something. Yeah, before you, know, you give your lectures and everything, I'd like to show you something. Yeah, a friend of mine, he said, that I've known from childhood is, uh, has a position in the Museum of Natural History. And he's going to show us tomorrow uh, a human skeleton of a human being 10 feet tall from some Pacific Island. And I said, wow. All right. So finally I'm going to see, you know, put my hands on or see, at least see and right, yeah. hopefully photograph. So we went there the next morning. You know, he, he met his friend. His friend kind of took us around the museum saying, here's the dinosaurs, here's this, here's that. And we, he, we kind of asked him, well, what, what about the large size human skeleton? And he said, I'm sorry, we can't see that. So I just kind of had to wonder, well, what, what's going on here? You know, he told his friend since childhood, you know, that, uh, and there are two prominent people, you know, like, that he was going to show us the skeleton yeah. and in the end he did all I can think of is that somehow that morning he must have told some of his colleagues at the museum what he was going to do and they said no way you can't do that oh you man know, so. well, that's a, <laughs> a huge disappointment I'd be so disappointed in that wow but you know that is uh, well let me take this caller and then I'll comment on that let's see we have a uh, but I do think giants did exist. Okay. Okay, all right. Cool. Very cool. All right, 619, area code. You're on the air with Michael Cremo. Who are you speaking with? 619. Is this the same person that called in last night and just didn't say nothing? I think it is. All right. We're going to 619, area code. Going once. Hello? There you are. Oh, we got you. Uh, yeah, I'm... Well, I'm happy to talk to you. I, I did call last night. I'm not trying to call in and ask a question. I'm trying to listen on my telephone. Uh, okay, and I well, get this number, 800-588-0335. Well, when I give out that number, that's the call-in number to the show when you want to talk to the guest. If you want to know what the call-to-listen line is, you go to TalkStreamLive.com and click on the Fringe FM, and the number will be lit up there for you. There's a call to listen line for every talk stream live show. This is 719. You know, it's there. I think they change it from time to time, though, but that's where it is. So just know when you call in at 1 800 588 0335, that's not a listen line. That's the actual show. Anyway, sorry about that, Michael. But what, wouldn't people no, say, no problem. wouldn't people say that? That could easily get passed off, I guess, by scientists who say, well, that's just kind of like a one-off deal. You know, like you were mentioning with Jeffrey Mishlove, sometimes they'll say, uh, you know, they'll try to make up something that was a one-off deal. It's just a, a fluke or a genetic fluke or something like that. And then they can just explain it away and, and keep the whole Darwin and theory of evolution. And I don't know if, has anybody ever asked you about the... Uh, theory of evolution via natural selection, you know, where only the strong survive kind of thing, or does that even matter in this case? I don't think it does, does it? But Well, not in, in this particular case, but people do ask, and, and a lot of, uh, my work is definitely inspired, you know, by my studies and the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which reveal a lot of things. I mean, it talks about yoga and meditation and things like that. But it also has some interesting details about, you know, the history of life and the universe and things like that. And basically, the, the indication we get from these literatures, and not just them, but other ancient wisdom traditions also have similar ideas I mean, I'm not claiming to have any monopoly on truth, but uh, the uh, the picture we get is that 
the forms of all the different kinds of bodies, plant bodies, insect bodies, bird bodies, fish bodies, bear bodies, tiger bodies, human bodies, they all exist in the mind of God forever. Uh And universes are created and destroyed endlessly, and they're but they're all populated, and and on, on the, say on this planet, this Earth planet that we're on, yeah, you know, there we can see the different kinds of bodily vehicles that have been there for souls, conscious selves, to operate in the, in the material level of reality. They've always existed, and. It's not that one type of body evolves into another. It's that the self, the soul in the body can over time move to another body Mm. because it's learned some lessons. It's consciousness has been elevated. So you can go from, you know, a, a, one say from a monkey's body to a Neanderthal body to a human body. It's not that the necessarily that it's not that the, the bodies are evolving, but we're the soul is evolving in the process of reincarnation or transmigration of the soul. It's moving from one body to another. So that we could call an evolution of consciousness, but it's not an evolution of the different body types. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, just like I'm, yeah, go ahead. Well, that makes sense because I've talked to Laird Scranton about this, you know, cause people talk, people talk about, uh, when we die, I can't wait to die so we can go to heaven and get away from this terrible place. And I, but yet, and I told Laird this, and I, I'm curious of what you think, too. I said, it seems to me that uh, the universe is conspiring to create life so that it can live through it like it's a purposeful thing, like it wants life, and maybe consciousness living life in this physical realm could be one of the biggest uh, things that the universe is actually trying to do. Who knows? But I don't. I just can't look at life in the physical realm as just this terrible place that we're supposed to leave, you know? It just doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me to look at it that way. I think. Um, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Well, I think what you're saying makes a little bit more sense to me, though. Yeah, you go ahead. No, I I would agree with you in this. You you could compare it to like a school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where you have an opportunity to to make a a better future for yourself and others. Uh, so, uh, technically how it works according to the Bhagavad Gita and other ancient Indian texts is that we're actually made of three things. There's the soul, the conscious self, then there's kind of a mental and intellectual, subtle, material body. And then beyond that, there's the gross physical machinery of the body. So we're kind of like matter, mind, and spirit, basically. And what happens at the time of death is that the soul and the mental body go to another body, another bodily vehicle. And the type of uh, bodily vehicle one gets is determined by the state of your mental intellectual body that you know, contains your desires and feelings and ambitions and goals and all of that. That's part of the subtle material body. And if you, like you say, you know, you take the opportunity of advancing elevating the the state of your subtle mental body, it'll carry you gradually up to the human form where you have the opportunity. And it's like you could either 
spiritualize this world, you know, if everyone in it had the right consciousness, it would be not different from the spiritual world or heaven or whatever yeah. name people yeah. want to give it, the ideal state, however they envision it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how I would you know, tie these things together. I, I, I think what you said is you know, correct. It is an opportunity. I just, uh, I just like, uh, to be honest with you, uh, Michael, like, I don't know how spiritual of a person you are. I can tell. I mean, it's kind of a dumb question for me to even say, right? But as much as you talk about, uh, you know, the Vedas and Hindu uh, teachings and Sanskrit, it, it's either you're a spiritual person or you just really are into it or both. But I got to tell you, like, the more I get into this stuff, the more I get into spirit, the more I get into studying it and uh, meditation and conscious exploration. It it doesn't just excite me in those realms. It also makes me want to live more too. Mm -hmm. does, does that make sense? It makes me want to live physically sure. more so that I can experience the, the difference. I don't know. I'm a lot happier well, of a person uh, because of it. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. Oh, that's great. Everybody should be happy doing what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So when it comes down to the evidence, I guess, why would, why do we always consider this stuff regardless? Like you could take these three bones that you were talking about. There's no, there's no a woo woo fringe or anything about it and that's the evidence is the evidence when it comes to archaeology it, it is what it is especially if i guess if you extract things properly or whatever but um mm -hmm. how, why don't i just still don't understand why we can't acknowledge it uh why is it considered fringe and i have to think that a part of it is is and i hope i don't offend anybody when i say this but i have to think a part of it is because there's a lot of confirmation bias that goes on in this realm too, because people want to believe in some of this stuff so bad that they, um, they negate any, uh, I guess, uh, evidence to say, or, or vice evidence against it is what I'm saying. Uh, kind of, you know what I mean by confirmation bias. They're always looking for a reason to prove that there is an alien or there are giants instead of just looking at the evidence, like you were saying with Jeffrey Mishlove, and then just letting that person decide. There seems like there's a narrative always being pushed on one side or the other, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And uh, just uh, from archaeology, you know, I'll give an example, a recent example. This, this, at first, this may not seem so significant, but in 2016, some archaeologists working at Ulduvai Gorge in Tanzania, it's an archaeological site there. And they found a, you know, mostly what they find there, the scientists who work there find skeletons of various kinds of hominins, ape men, like Australopithecus and Homo erectus, Homo habilis, you know, supposed human ancestors. And one, one group of archaeologists found uh, a finger bone. Like, if you look at your little finger, mm -hmm. you know, the, at the base of it, you know, there's, there's actually a little bone there. So they found one of these bones there, and they looked at it, and they determined, well, it's human-like. Uh, you know, they, they carefully compared it to the same finger bone and from different species of apes and monkeys, different species of ape men like Australopithecus that lived supposedly maybe 3 million years ago or something. And, and they also compared it to those finger bones of anatomically modern humans. And they found it fit in the human group. 
not Neanderthal or Australopithecus. It's not ape or monkey or baboon or any 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 of the uh, apes that are around in Africa. Uh, they, uh, but see, the problem was it was found in layers of rock one million eight hundred thousand years old. So, which directly goes the against their two hundred year two hundred thousand year thing or whatever, right? Yeah. Right. That's what that's what the consensus is now. Maybe they're pushing it to three hundred thousand years. So one almost two million years ago, one point eight million years ago. The, so what they wrote in their scientific report was was published in Nature Communications, which is a prominent scientific journal. They wrote uh and I'm paraphrasing a little bit because I don't have the text, exact text right here in front of my nose to sure. read. But they said, we've studied this bone. Uh, it's, they call it OH86. Yeah, that, that was the official name for it. Ulduvai hominin 86. This, uh, it's like that of Homo sapiens. But we can't call it Homo sapiens, obviously, because of its geological age. So they can be, you know, scientists today can be looking at evidence that screams human beings were existing 1,800,000 years ago. But they can't. It, it just doesn't fit like that. So, it's a, so it's like the golden rule, almost as if it's a scientific law itself, to not go against what's already been told as far as our historical narrative. Uh, that that's yeah. They're they're seeing what they've been trained to see. You know, there was an interesting psychological experiment that was done. That you know, the researchers took a deck of cards and they change some of the cards in the deck. Like you have six of uh, hearts, six mm-hmm. of hearts. It'll only be red. You have red hearts, red six, and they turned it black. And they did that. They made similar changes on some of the cards in the deck. And then they would show a person, a subject, in this experiment, they would take a subject, and they show the subject each card in the deck and ask the person to identify it. Yeah. So it shows us, yeah, Jack of Spades, Queen of Hearts, this, that. And they show them like the, one of the altered cards, say like the, the six of hearts that was black. Right. And they go, six of spades, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's in, like. In other words, they, they don't see what's, they're actually seeing, they see what they're accustomed to think they should be seeing. Wow. I mean, that's, they found it was... But that's not... But see, only, but the rarest, only the rarest person would say, wait, wait, wait a minute, let me, let me look at that one again. Something's, really? But, but, so you're saying it's but, just a makeup I mean, of, of the human mind to do that, right? To go along with what it's been programmed to see. What it's been programmed to know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get what you're saying. Yeah, but still, uh, and we, yeah, we have to take a break here, but still, I still think that you, there's people like you out there doing this because maybe it might shake that person that one time to get us out of our human conditions and say, well, yeah, wait, I'm looking at something totally different here. You know, and I think that's kind of mm-hmm. what you're, you're doing. You're saying, no, it's a spade. Look at it again. It's a spade. So now what, right? That's what needs, that's the, yeah. yeah, that's the cool part about this whole thing. Look, if you guys want to call in, you can win tickets. Um, we've given them away a bunch of tickets. But if you got a question for Michael, too, you call in to ask our guest a question. It's 1 800 555. Or if you just want to call in to win tickets, you can leave a shout out on the Fringe FM app. We'll be right back. More Lighting the Void coming up. Stay with us.
AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Are you stressed? I mean, who isn't? Anxiety creeping in? No, not that. Is sleep hard to attain because your brain just won't slow down? We're living in crazy times, and the fear knob has been turned up. Okay, there's an answer. Take a big breath, exhale, and go log on to AncientLifeOil.com. CBD, broad and full spectrum, organic and non-GMO CBD for you to enjoy. Change your tune from fear to calm, from brain overload to clear thinking. 0.003 THC on full spectrum and 0% THC on broad spectrum. Competitive pricing with the best quality. Also know everything is going to get better. No worries. Be happy. CBD can help calm so your nerves don't think they're a six-string electric guitar. Enjoy life, smile, and log on to AncientLifeOil.com for great CBD. That's AncientLifeOil.com. You'll Follow be glad The Fringe you did. FM on Facebook and Twitter. You're listening the to Fringe KTFM. FM. Digital Broadcasting. How do you think you would react if you knew the truth? The Fringe FM. With a horrific tragedy befalls a man. <laughs> He comes up with a diabolical and sinister plan. Nothing will stop us, darling. Nothing can stop us now. With the help of those who are not what they seem. (laughs) His tale of terror will be told this Halloween. One night only. One night only. October the 31st. Be there and be scared. Hola, French listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange. And you're listening to The Fringe FM. Born out of the alchemical tradition of Paracelsus is a medical tradition called Spideria. Though not many people practice this work today, Phoenix Aurelius has been researching and teaching this work for the last 15 years, and he needs your support. Hi, I'm Phoenix Aurelius, and I'm the founder of the Phoenix Aurelius Research Society, where I perform modern scientific research on the methods and techniques of Paracelsian alchemy and spagyria for health, wellness, agriculture, ecology, and more. All my work is 100% funded by the public, so if you like what I'm doing and you want to support my research, please consider making a purchase of spagyric medicines for my apothecary, fund your own Spagyric IDF wellness research or participate in my group study or one-on-one immersion courses so that you can learn how to perform this work for yourself. I want to thank you in advance for your support. Visit thefringe.fm forward slash alchemy research and enter coupon code fringe and receive 15% off anything and everything on the website. That's thefringe.fm forward slash alchemy research and thank you for doing your part and keeping alchemy alive in the modern day. You're listening to KTLK Digital Broadcasting. May I have the password, please? The Fringe FM. That's right, sir. That is the password. What happens when you bring the Fringe FM together with the world's leading paranormal experts and influencers? What if no topic was off the table, including paranormal events, conspiracy theory, witchcraft, psychic abilities, astrology, ufology, and more? And what would happen if you broadcast this event in crystal clear video live around the world, allowing viewers to interact with their favorite presenters? You would have created the monster that is the Fringe Fest 2020. Two nights only, Friday, October 30th and Saturday, October 31st. Go to thefringefest.com for more info. Get your tickets today at thefringefest.com. That is thefringefest.com. Trick or truth, it's up to you. What do you believe might not be? Step into the zone of the best unknown. You and those aliens, those big groups, conspiracies and cover-ups. And to the pair of normal we go. I'm Jeremy Scott. Travel with me into the paranormal. Live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, here on The Fringe FM. I don't know all the answers to the questions about reality.
Hey, this is Macon, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Root. So I know that you guys that have been listening to the show for a long time, you can tell I'm tripping over my words. And uh, I'm glad Michael's been real patient with me here because these are the biggest questions that we have to keep asking ourselves. And I really do appreciate the work uh, that people like Michael do or Jared or Robert Shock, where it, it's not, I mean, obviously they all have their own beliefs and stuff, but when they present evidence in a way that we can understand that's without doubt. That's at least a good place to start. It's not a controlled narrative either way. And that's what we discussed last night, and we're really hitting home with it again tonight. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can by going to patreon.com forward slash LTV radio or make a do- donation. There, that voice you heard was one of our uh, supporters uh, making. And we have a group in there that we do. If you sign up, it's called... Uh, The Astral Journal, which is just part of it, where we're all trying to figure out this out-of-body experience thing together because Robert Monroe had a theory that if a group of people put their minds to it and they were able to do this together, that they could change the face of humanity. And I personally believe that. So if you want to, like, come join that group with us, just sign up uh, to the Patreon and come hang out with us. Again, Michael, thank you so much for spending time with us here late night and talking about these subjects. Man, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Well, it's an honor to be here. And I think we all have our different parts to play in in this, I I don't know what you could call it, coalition or Mm -hmm. movement or whatever. You know, some are creating platforms uh, for communication like yourself and many others. And some of us are trying to do what we can to develop research that supports these kind of things. And um, then there's everyone else who's participating, even just by listening. So, right. so yeah, I totally agree. And and this is kind of one of those things where, uh, yeah, it's a community effort. And you know, you know that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because you're obviously good at it. Everybody, I was like, I don't know a lot of the names in this field. Honestly, I really don't. I'm mostly buried in a computer or tech stuff. But when I told everybody, it's like, hey, Michael Cremo's coming on my show tonight. I was like, wow, you know. So you got a big fan club and you got a big base, which tells me that I'm behind on your books here. I need to get involved. I need to get reading on them. And all of the books, you guys, most of them, for the most part, are there's several different formats, Uh, Kindle, regular hardback, Audible. Um, I think I'm probably going to grab probably Human De-Evolution because that's, you know, that is something I'm mostly interested in too. But I know that I think your latest book is uh, My Science, My Religion. Is that correct? Or that's one of your latest books? Yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, all of my books are available on my website, mcremo.com, M-C-R-E-M-O dot com. And for those who get a copy of My Science, My Religion from my website, you can get it other places, but if you want to do me a favor, you can get it directly from my website and the people that get my science, my religion, 
which is a collection of uh, papers that I've presented at scientific conferences about these things. If those who are really deeply in, into these topics and want to know how it's possible to present these things to people who all, don't already accept them, they may want to have a look at that book. And those who get that book, My Science, My Religion, from the website mcremo.com will also have the opportunity to get, if they want it, a free copy of Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the ancient wisdom books from India that greatly inspired my work. And uh, as far as the other books like Human Devolution, if you get them on the website, you, you'll also get four issues of Atlantis Rising magazine, uh, which has a column that I write called The Forbidden Archaeologist in it. So get one of the other books, like Human Devolution, from my website, and get uh, also, along with it, if you want them, four copies, different issues of Atlantis Rising magazine. So... You want to know something that that's really cool too. That I, I mean, I know I'm going back into the '90s here, but this the, the big when you say we all have our role to play. Sometimes we may think it's small, or we don't know how big it is. You know, you wrote a book about this. The next thing you know, uh, forbidden archaeology, right? It gets released. There's a bunch of responses, a bunch of polar. Of course, there's some polarity. Some people are going to say it's hogwash. And then you got other people like Graham Hancock that's got your back. I love Graham Hancock, by the way. And then you end up on, uh, uh, the book ends up on the mysterious origins of man with Charlton Heston. And so this, what I'm trying to say is, is when I talk about these big questions, it doesn't, it just can just take one man to, to show some evidence. And I'm not downplaying this by no means, because you show quite a bit of evidence more than most, uh, to just stir it up because I think everybody no matter how intelligent you are, no matter your background, deep down, everybody wants to know the answers to these questions. So uh, I think a lot of people look up to you, Michael, because it, it takes quite a bit of bravery uh, to go at this stuff and just start presenting information despite years and years and years of education and facts. Um, and I think that's what stirs the soul. Don't you agree? Uh, yes. And like you said, we all have our roles to play. I mean, you were mentioning about you know, how my book, uh, Forbidden Archaeology, got on that NBC yeah. television special called Mysterious Origins of Man. And, you know, that kind of happened in an interesting way. Uh, you know, there was this lady from Louisiana I'm trying to remember her name right now, but she was head of a little alternative archaeology organization in Louisiana called the Louisiana Mound Society. And one day she was talking with me on the phone and said, Michael, I got, you know, I can, and she was a Southern lady accent. And she said, I, you know, I got a copy of your book. I really like it. And, going to write about it in my newsletter. You know, you should get in touch with Bill Cote because he's working on a documentary now that he's going to put on NBC. I think he would love your book. You know, so I got in touch with, she gave me his contact information. I got in touch with him, sent him the book, and then he got back to us and said, I would like to include some of this material in this uh documentary and you know so that's how that happened again it was like you know you just make your little effort whatever it is right and you, you never know who's going to turn up to help you or or hinder you as, well as it may be but uh, but help help so that that kind of networking really is interesting i do think i i, I am a believer when you're do when you do what you're being called to do or you just do it a lot of things start happening like that and um absolutely i, I also believe that 
I don't know if it's some kind of weird game or perhaps that consciousness doesn't know what it is in total. But I think that it wants us to ask these questions. You know, a lot of times we hear these things like, oh, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking about your book, uh, De-Evolution, um, and how spirit came down into matter. And so a lot of times you'll hear the, the pessimists say, well, it's God's kind of like sick game to throw us down here and make us forget because we're all just, uh, have you ever heard that someone say that? We're all just chess pieces on the board or whatever. But I don't get that, man. I think, I think it just wants to experience itself. That's what I think is going on here. Um, and some type of growth thing, but I don't know. I'm not very well studied on uh, the, uh, I guess, religions and the Vedas and all that as well as you are. Um, let me see. Maybe uh, maybe this is a real caller here. 978 area code. You're on the air with Michael Primo. Who are you speaking with? Hey, what's going on, Joe? It's the Night Stalker. What's up, Night Welcome Stalker? Back. Welcome back, brother. We missed you. Yeah. Well, I'm fumbling tonight, brother, so you, you got to help me out here. Have you won no, tickets, no, no. by the way? You already got tickets, don't you? That's why I'm calling. Um, so I won them last week, but I had already bought them, so I said I don't need them. But then I gave them away as the Night Stalker. So can I still get the free ones? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely, brother. You get the tickets right, for well. sure. <laughs> do you got a question for Michael? Right, sure. have you, though? I do. Uh, it's kind of a weird one, but um, I was wondering if you ever – looked into the idea of like the world grid or that a lot of these ancient sites are somehow aligned and like kind of connect across the world. And maybe that could be some like alignment is an easy way to, to confirm, or it's a great evidence of like a previous culture of all these seemingly disconnected sites or in some way connected. Have you looked into that at all or, um, uh, you know, it, it, the, the past couple of years, I. Uh, I, a lot of people have been writing to me about that. It was, you know, something, you know, I was, I mean, aware of the general principle, because you know, it's been around yeah. for a long time, but now there are a lot of researchers really getting deeply into it because structures that ancient people built were usually deliberately aligned towards the cardinal cardinal uh, points on the earth, you know, north, south, east, west, you know, so they, they would be shaped like that, but the, like if it was the square building, you know, the, 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 you know, if you went directly from one of the surfaces, it, it would be pointing due north. And, you know, because the north, you know, the, uh, at least this is the way it's been explained to me. There's the crust of the earth. It sometimes shifts. So the, the geographical North pole will also shift along yeah. with, with, uh, the, uh, the, the whole crust. So that means years ago, millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago, North would be in a different direction. And you know, some of these researchers, uh, somebody, Michael Carlotto, Carlotto, I think is one of them. Uh, they've studied thousands, you know, the alignments of thousands of ancient structures that are oriented like that. And they kind of seem to be uh, some of them point to a different location of the North Pole. And these crustal shifts, they're not happening all the time, but, you know, sometimes they're rapid. And, you know, so by seeing which way the buildings are aligned in South America, Asia, Africa, wherever they find these structures, ancient structures, they're aligned slightly differently. And that would give some idea when the original structure was built, first built. Yeah. Uh, the, so the, um, the one that a very, very interesting concept. The uh, one that kind of got me into it, or like kind of uh, was like really wild to see, was I went and I visited uh, America Stonehenge in uh, New Hampshire. And uh, 
they play a little video when you first walk in. It's like a little 10 minute video. And uh, like um, the owner, Drew Stone, um, his son, I guess, so, like, he's, he's kind of narrating this video. And his son, I guess, was using um, Google Earth to, uh, to, to kind of extend the alignments. And when he extended the alignment to the summer solstice um, sunset, it went directly smack dab in the middle of the Stonehenge um, in, in England, like right through the middle. That's across the ocean. So when, when that kind of, uh, when I saw that, I was like, oh, wow, like, could that be global? So I think it's a really cool thread, but really great show. I'll let you guys go. Oh, thanks for your call. Congrats on the tickets. Good question. Later, Thank you. Yeah, I never thought about that. You know, people talk about the structures and the grids and everything. I just, uh, I don't know. I know that that's interesting what you're talking about, how stuff shifts like that, too. Uh, the North Pole shift shifted this year, didn't it? It shifted quite a bit. Uh, well, you have to think whether it's the magnetic North Pole or the geographic North Pole, which would be the axis, you know, of spin, you know, like, so there's two separate things, I think. Uh, yeah. You know, the, or the actual location the magnetic, is, and then the magnetic North. Yeah. Yeah. The actual North pole, and the magnetic North pole aren't exactly the same place. As far as I, I, I understand it. maybe I'm wrong. I could be, but that's, well, I, let me well, ask I you this question. It's understand. it's going to be like it's going to be like a really heavy metaphysical type question, but you wrote you wrote a lot of books on this subject, right? Um, I know you know your stuff when it comes to the Vedas and spirituality, uh, as far as that goes too. So uh, this is mm-hmm. just your opinion that I'm asking for, or maybe what your belief is. Uh, to you, what is, and it might sound dumb to some, but what is a hum- what what is a human being? What is it really? Is it something that spawned from mm-hmm. apes that evolved from this uh, other type of being, or are we something entirely different and unique? You know, I would like to believe that, that we are, but maybe we're not. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, ultimately, every thing we see in the world of matter is a reflection of something that eternally exists on some higher level of reality. Uh, And it may be a perverted reflection. You know, like sometimes uh, you have, uh, say, a tree apple tree by a pond Mm. and it'll be reflected in the pond. So if the pond is still, then the reflection looks just like the tree standing on the shore. But if the pond is, if there's wind and there's waves and the water is disturbed, the image of the uh, tree will be disturbed. So according to my understanding, my conviction is that the human body or any other type of body is a vehicle for an eternal soul that is in the world of matter. And each material vehicle that it occupies is temporary. You know, like, it you know, lasts for, if you're in the human form of life, say a maximum of about 100 years or so. For not everyone, but for most, you know, it doesn't last that long. Right. So, but what makes it special, the human form of life, is that you have the opportunity to by different processes of yoga and meditation to kind of still the pond of uh, the mind, you could say, so that reflects accurately the reality that is on 
the shore, where, which is where you really belong, and you're able to do that, you know. So, whereas yeah, so in other forms of life, it's, you could say the, the pond is disturbed, you know, it's not really accurately reflecting what the reality is. So that's so that's kind of the whole what I see. God, uh, man made in God's image, kind of, uh, or the image of God or the image of Creator. I mean, yeah, because there is a big difference between us and a platypus, right? I mean, <laughs> we, yeah, we well, look well in, in one sense, yes, and in one sense, no. As a soul, there's a soul in the body of a platypus. Right. There's a soul in my human body. But say, like, I'm a human being, and I can ride on a skateboard. I can ride on one of these little motorized scooters that you see in some cities. Uh-huh. And you can ride in a car. You can ride in a boat. You can ride in an airplane. You can ride. You're the same human being, but according to the vehicle that you have, you can act in different ways. You know, like... Oh, I see what you're gotta, saying. Yeah. You gotta, say if you're riding in a car, you can go generally go faster than somebody who's riding on a bicycle. You know, the same person can ride on a bicycle, can drive a car. So the same soul could be in the body of a platypus and in the body of a human being. And the body of the platypus, it's not gonna have a very complete picture of reality, won't have all the answers to these questions. Who am I, where did I come from? What's in the human form of life, that's possible. But the platypus, it's just that the soul is being limited by the vehicle that it's occupying. I don't know if it. Well, do you, uh, well, if that's the case, yeah, no, I, you're making sense. But um, if that's the case, then are our minds limited by? That's what I always wonder about this sometimes because you know people talk about the mind. It's not the actual physical brain. However, uh, if we have limited organs or a limited mind or a limited vehicle for the mind then we're going to have a limited capacity to be able to... That's right. Yeah. So... But... Hmm. But we're not the mind. That's part of the subtle, mental, material body. Uh, you can think of this in terms of the computer analogy. You've got computer user, computer software, computer hardware. So you could compare the gross physical body to the hardware. You compare the mind to the software. And the user would be like the soul. So the, the software, in other words, the mind is the interface between the soul and the body, gross physical body. It's the interface. And according to the condition, in other words, the capabilities of the software of the mind, you get a specific kind of uh, gross material form. So if you, in one lifetime, what you're basically doing is you're programming yourself for your next physical embodiment. If you program it in a certain way, then your mind, you know, your, because sometimes we say, you know, my mind, my body, you know, it's, I get we, we recognize our mind is programmed to act in different ways. You know, confronted with certain situations, we get depressed. With other situations, we become happy. Uh, yeah, but if we program our minds 
properly that our next embodiment is going to be a, an improved version, I think. That's and, what I think, too. I think we're in some kind of state of uh, of becoming. And I, and I don't mean it in like yeah. an evolutionary way, I guess. I mean, maybe it is, but... You it, call it evolution of the soul. Yeah. That we are in some kind of... Or, or being prepped for or being evolved in, into a different state of becoming something, whatever's bigger than this thing. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think about a lot of that stuff too. Because, And you know what? When I look into it, people are probably thinking, man, you're talking to Michael Cremo. Why don't you talk about, you know, ancient aliens and uh, ancient artifacts and all of the stuff that he writes about? Well, he writes about this stuff too, um, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But they're, it's kind of connected in a way. Mm-hmm. Say the archaeological evidence, the stones and bones, what that adds up to is we need a new explanation for human origins. Where did we come from? And if you've got all this evidence showing that humans like us existed for a long, long time, then that should inspire a person to ask, okay, if what they're telling us now in the education system is not the real truth, then what is? Right. And, and people would write to me like that. So the next book in the series was Human Devolution, which is not about so much about the stones and the bones, but more like the kinds of things that we've been talking about. So one leads to the other mm. you know, for some people. They go, okay, yeah, we need a new explanation. Here's, here's an explanation. And, and I was kind of happy you know, to not talk about the explanation in forbidden archaeology. Uh, that's something else. Um, so, yeah, they want they I, I, want you to give out all the details, me, right? Take, give me the details. Yeah, Tell me every that, little thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, then let people make up their own minds about it and you know, come up with their own theory. You know, maybe it was extraterrestrials, maybe it was time travelers, maybe, like Michael Primo says, there were ancient civilizations. Right. And, yeah, so. Are you, okay, be honest with me, though. Are you putting out all this information for that reason, obviously, but also to kind of spark people's intuitions a little bit. I think deep down, we all have this well, kind of knowing that something ain't right with our history here, you know? Well, there's a lot, a lot of reasons for what I do. And there, I mean, in, in the core of my being, you could say I'm a yogi. I'm a, a, I practice something called bhakti yoga. Bhakti the yoga. yoga yeah. of devotion yoga of devotion and part of that system of yoga is that you take whatever talent or ability you have and use it for a higher spiritual purpose so you can say that's my motive i i have some ability to write and speak and research and lecture and do the do those kinds of things so I could have used it for any purpose, but I think I made the correct decision to, because originally when I was young, I, I was headed for a career in one of the intelligence services. You know, I was at the George Washington University School of International Relations, which is, which graduates of which go into government well, you're going to be a, a spy. Lot, you know, <laughs> military or intelligence, civilian intelligence agencies. Yeah. But at a certain point, I, I, I decided I, I got to go on another path. That's not really very satisfying. So I went on a more spiritual path. But the same abilities that I might have used for some other purpose 
I found, okay, it can be used for a higher purpose. So I look at what I do as part of my practice of yoga, and it's, for, it's to help me, in a sense, understand myself and the world around me and the people around me. It, you know, it's something, uh, you know, I had, had a, a guru, I'm a disciple of a guru, and this is uh, something that uh, he wanted. He wanted people to be engaged in some work that was their nature. So it's just my nature to communicate. So uh, I decided to do it like this. And hopefully it's helping me, it's helping others, hopefully. And so you could say, well, that's my inner motive, you could say. At least that's how I see it at this moment. Yeah, that's a kind of, it's kind of strange, but that's kind of what I'm doing. And I think a lot of people are being asked to do that right now. But the thing is, is uh, when you're being guided by your spirit and you're being motivated to do what you want to do from your soul, the the outcome isn't guaranteed. You don't know what's going to happen. But I think you have to give in to the urge uh, and find out sometimes. I mean, look at all the books you wrote now. That one book spawned a whole, just a whole series of books and stuff and speaking events. And now, you know, everybody wants to hear what you got to say next about it. All because, you know, you just wanted some, just wanted to show people the, the truth. Isn't that something? I want to show myself. I want to show myself <laughs> more than anybody. You know? As far as what other people do, that's up to them because I respect the Yeah, but you get, you, you're soul. giving them that option where they didn't have it before. Um, that's right. That's kind of, that's kind of what I, I try to do with conscious exploration and stuff uh, and the radio show, but it's, I get to the point sometimes, Michael, where I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's getting through or not, you know. But, anyways, I I suspect that it is getting through. Yeah, it may that, not be. Uh, uh, I mean, it would be nice to live at a time when one's personal convictions were shared by all the elites in the society in which one lives. And one could play one's role in that society. And, but sometimes it's not like that. And a, a person is confronted, well, am I going to conform to the society and just keep this as my private little thing inside? Or am I going to make it a big thing in, in my own core of my own existence and at the expense of maybe being in a minority, a, a marginalized group in terms of the society that I have to live in. Difficult, difficult decisions for any individual to make. Well, speaking of difficult I, I, decisions, what was the hardest thing that you think, I would say the most challenging time for you? Because I know you had... You probably have had to have at least once or twice uh, some people come against your work or, or say that you're, you know, that you're full of it or you're a fraud or whatever. I mean, they did it to John Anthony West. They did it to a lot of different people. Did you experience that sure. too? Uh, yeah, you experience things like that. But, you know, I just kind of look, all right, that's what I signed up for. Right, you know, I got you. I didn't have to do. I didn't have to do this. You know, I if, if I wanted to be accepted and by everyone, I, I would have stuck to my original plan. You know, to become you know something else and yeah, you know, be part of some the big establishment or whatever it is. Uh, so I, I I think I kind of knew. That was going to happen. And you're right. Yeah. There, there are these crisis points in life, in, in one's life experience, where one has to 
make decisions. You know, and I, but, but I've always kind of felt intuitively at least that steps were being put in front of me and I had the choice to step this way or that way. Was it Robert Frost had this famous poem about, you know, coming to a crossroads where you can go one way or the other, take the way less traveled or the more well-traveled route. And so sometimes uh, each individual in their own way and their own sphere of activities is confronted with these choices. And uh, I've just taken it step by step. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a recurring theme we've talked about on the broadcast for sure. I, what, so out of all the research you've done with all the cases, um, and all of the different um, scenarios that we've discussed and that you've discussed in your work, what do you think the most, prof- like out of everything you've done, it could be a tough question, but out of all the stuff you've researched and brought out to the forefront, what do you think is the most profound piece of evidence out there, if you had to pick one, that our history and humans go back way further than we think into the, like, what do you think, 60 million or like the Vedas say, 150 million? Do you really believe that it goes back that far? And if you do, what's the one piece of evidence that if you had to pick out of the crop, the one that you would grab? Yeah, it's, uh, well, this may sound really deep. I'm going to answer your question in the sense that you put it, but first I'm going to say something. To me, the most amazing thing is that anything at all exists. <laughs> right. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah, that, that, is the, that is the most amazing thing. And then when you get deeply thinking about that, that leads in all kinds of directions. <laughs> but in terms of the question that you put to me, uh, by whatever path, you know, you're going to wind up at, at that understanding. But in, in terms of the question that you put it in the sense that I think you meant it to be taken, I would say one case that I've always really found very fascinating is the California gold mine discoveries. Like in the 19th century, gold was discovered in California. Mm-hmm. And people went there to mine it, get it, get the gold. They dug mines into the sides of mountains in the Sierra Nevada mountains at the gold mining region. And deep inside the tunnels, they found human bones, human artifacts, you know, obsidian spear points, stone mortars and pestles, human skeletal remains embedded in the gold bearing deposits. So, uh, these came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. He was educated at Harvard University, and he became fascinated by it. And he started doing his own research, collecting the artifacts, noting all the conditions under which they were found, and he published a whole book about them that came out from Harvard University's Museum of comparative uh, zoology in the year 1880. And according to modern geologists, the age of the formations at which these objects were found is about 50 million years. Wow. And keep in mind that, the, like you, you mentioned a couple of times, according to modern science, humans like us first came into existence less than 300,000 years ago. So 50 million years, pretty amazing. So it was published in a scientific publication, came out from Harvard University, but we don't hear about these discoveries today because of a process of knowledge filtering. There was an anthropologist, a contemporary of Whitney's, 
William Holmes. He worked at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And he said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of evolution, he wouldn't have published that book. He wouldn't have come to those conclusions. He should have known that can't possibly be true. You know? So it was kind of his discoveries were kind of suppressed. So I think that's a, to me, that, that was a kind of a really interesting. That's the big one. Yeah. So I, so I actually did some research. You know, I went to the museum of anthropology at the university of California at Berkeley, where they have some of these things stored away. They're not shown to the public artifacts from the California gold mines. Oh, wow. And I, I was able to get permission from the directors of the museum to see them. And they took me to, they're kept in a storage building at some distance from the museum. And I was able to study them and photograph them. And uh, so that was a really, it also went into the Sierra Nevada mountains and relocated some of the 19th century gold mining tunnels. That, that, to me, that's a, you, you asked them about my favorite case. I think I, I would probably say that. Yeah, that's it. Well, that sounds that sounds very uh, compelling too. It sounds like it, that. That's what I meant. Like if you had to, if there was say a courtroom, and you know, on one side they were trying to say, well, history is the way we've always said it is, and you're the plaintiff or whatever, and you come and say, I have uh, some evidence here, and yet that's the one you wanted to pick. That's a pretty good one, though, right? I mean, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer. because, But you got to experience it, too. I think there's something to be said about getting involved in, in experiencing what you're doing, too, instead of just, uh, I guess, kind of contemplating it. When you get around it, you can, you can kind of experience it all together. Because all we do here, uh, Michael, is we just ask questions on the show, and then we talk about it. And for once, I would like to, I don't know, this is going to sound wackadoo, actually see uh, a, an alien or a Sasquatch or a, even a UFO and know it's a UFO for sure. I've done that once in my life. But all the stuff that we talk about, the only thing that's ever really happened to me is the conscious exploration stuff and also learning about alternate history. That's really the biggest, the two biggest things that I can say for sure I know are real, if that makes any sense. It, absolutely, it makes sense. And you just have to decide, okay, I'm going to do something. I'm going to look for evidence for UFOs. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, and actually, you learn a lot by doing. Uh, you know, like a lot of people would ask me when Forbidden Archaeology came out, uh, what's what's been the impact of that? You know, what? And how you find out is by going, going to scientific conferences, talking to people, going to museums where these artifacts are stored and saying, can I see them? You know, and, and then you, you see what happens. You see how people react to the book, how they react when you're speaking to them. How, and you learn that it's, it's when, when you, you talk about knowledge filtering, it's not just an idea. You see it. You experience it as you're trying to do this. You know, that's, yeah. so you learn a lot by doing things. I totally so agree. I think you're, yeah. Yeah, I totally I'm disagreeing agree. I'm with you. I'm yeah. just saying I, my personal life is an example of that. Yeah, it's all it's all theory till you get your hands involved with it, and then it's then you start learning stuff that. Uh, yeah, I could say the same for radio too, for sure. Well, look, I know you got uh, we got to roll out of here, but do you have uh, 
any last things that you want to say to our audience or any last things that you'd uh, like to promote? I know the you do an article in the magazine, right? You still doing that? Well, when it was, it was Atlantis Rising magazine, I had a column called The Forbidden Archaeologist. So it was kind of a, a place where I could explain my ideas in short, easy to read, bite sized bits, mm. you know. And, but that, I think last year or two years ago, they ceased publishing. You know, the publishers of print versions of magazines and things are having a, a hard time these days. So I think they went over to some digital version. But uh, so I had that column for many years. If people are interested, uh, they could get the book for the. Per- the forbidden archaeologist, gotcha. not forbidden archaeology, but forbidden archaeologist from my website, collection of those columns. But I would say the, the message I would leave to people is uh, keep on, keep on doing everything you're doing. And if you've got some time and, uh, Anything I said sparked a little interest in you. Have a look at the books that are available on my website. Yeah, there. Uh, I'm gonna get go get on them myself. I'm reading the reviews here. They're extremely detailed, and everybody is in love with your work. And uh, just keep on doing what you're doing. And thank you so much for coming on the broadcast and hanging out with us late night. It was an honor and a pleasure, Joe. Thanks a yeah, lot. Likewise. All right, guys, I'm going to put the uh, the links that will be when the archives get released. Uh, it should be here shortly, too. All those links that we talked about tonight will be there. Stay tuned for The Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable. Tomorrow night, we'll be here with the New Moon Special with Mary Ducina. More coming from the Friends. You guys have a good night.